Well, friends, we are in a new year, and so we're starting this new series. The series is going to be about, as you may have guessed from the kids' time, about Daniel. And it's really more than that. It's about living in exile. Um, Today's going to be just a little different from most days. Uh, I'm going to give sort of an extended introduction to the series as a whole, and then we'll be talking about our sermon text and this specific story. Um, let's, Let's start with the scripture itself. Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the New International. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles in the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. I read that, I'm thinking, well, I would have been left out. (laughs) All right. He would have to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. After that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. I want to talk to us first about where we are. Sort of a new year, time to take stock. It's 2015. Do you know, in my family over this Christmas break, I was talking to my grandfather. My grandfather is 99 years old. He was born in 1915. He'll turn 100 this year, God willing. He's seen a little bit of change in his lifetime. All right, granddaddy remembers when he went to church, a family, he was raised on a farm, family with nine kids. They went to church in a horse and buggy to their Presbyterian church every Sunday. And that church was really the center of their community's life. Every wedding, every funeral, every family reunion. It was the center of their community's life. The minister's sermon every week was printed in the local newspaper. Because everybody just thought, that's something everybody's got to know. Right? Maybe somebody couldn't make it to church, and so we should print that in the newspaper every week. Uh, He was raised in a world where there was a set of values, of traditional values. And the same values at church and at school and in the culture and in the state, and all of those had the same values. Uh, so he was raised at, there was Bible class in his school. Uh, they prayed every morning just before saying the Pledge of Allegiance, which at that time did not include the words under God because everybody knew that. It was a very different time. Now, I'm not going to pretend that all of those values were perfect. I'm not going to pretend that their world was perfect. It wasn't. But there was some consistent understanding that to be a good citizen was to be a good Christian, and those were all the same thing. My kids are being raised in a very different world. 
For many of those traditional values that were considered good at that time are actually considered wrong today. Think, you know, prayer in school back then was considered a community building experience. Now it's considered sort of oppressive to minorities uh, and minority points of view. Uh, so if nowadays, to, to the extent that some people who are standing for traditional marriage, and it's called hate in our culture today. What used to be considered public good is now considered private and sometimes not good at all. Um, you can see this in, I mentioned my newsletter article, in the governor's debates. You can see this in so many different ways in our culture. Um, a lot of people to my grandfather's generation, or just those of us who look at history on a long term, it feels like our culture is turning upside down. What used to be black is white. What used to be white is black in many ways. And I'm not sure it was right side up to start with. But it seems to be flipping over from where it was. And a lot of people are asking, how do we live in a world that's turning upside down? Especially church people. Because, you know, church used to be the center of community life. It used to be sort of the guardian of the values of our culture. And it's not anymore. Uh, fewer and fewer people are attending church. Fewer and few, fewer people are connecting to church, and fewer and fewer people are even accepting the values that churches have, have proclaimed for a long time. How do we live in a world that's turning upside down? Well, the good news is, friends, we have a whole lot of context for how to do that because a lot of scripture was written in worlds that felt upside down. And, you know, one of the best examples is this guy named Daniel. Daniel Talk about a world that flipped upside down. What my grandfather experienced over a century, he experienced in a year. When Daniel was born, the Jewish people believed, hey, we are the people of God and God is on our side. And the proof was we are living in the promised land. We have got the temple in Jerusalem and we worship there. And we have the monarchy of David. God had promised that there's going to be a monarch from the line of David on the throne forever. And we have that monarch. He is our king right now. And sure, they didn't always follow all of God's ways. And yes, they dabbled in idolatry pretty much all the time. And yes, those prophets had been telling them for years, hey, if we don't shape up, God is going to punish us people. But those prophets were just nutty people, right? That's what everyone says about prophets anyway. They're just nut jobs. No, we know that we are God's people. We've got the promised land. We've got the temple. We've got the David's monarchy. God is on our side until the Babylonians came. When Daniel was just a child, the Babylonians came and they conquered the promised land. And they eventually destroyed the temple and ransacked its treasures. And they captured the king and killed all of his descendants in order to end the line of David. That was their intent. And they put their own puppet on the throne. And they took the people the leaders of the people, all the educated and skilled workers, they took them into exile in Babylon, kidnapped them hundreds and hundreds of miles away, left only the poorest of the land, the subsistence farmers, to farm the land so they could send tribute back to Babylon. They didn't have the promised land. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have the monarchy. They didn't have anything that told them they were God's people anymore. And they had to ask the question, what happened? And where is God? Right now in our culture, a lot of people, especially people of my grandfather's generation or just people with a view of history are asking the question, what happened? And where is God? Well, the Babylonians had an answer for them. Babylonians said, what happened is we beat you. And where is God? Our God beat your God. Our gods, they believed in a lot of gods, our gods are stronger than your gods. So you should just forget about your God and you should just start worshiping our gods. Forget about being Jews, just be good Babylonians like us. That's what everyone else we're conquering is doing. Friends, there are Babylonians in our culture who are saying the same things. There are Babylonians in our culture who are saying, look, the gods of secularism and relativism are just stronger. They're just smarter than believing in this God. This is just a natural evolution of thought. God is so outdated. That was last year. Well, God's people at that time said, no. No, we're going to believe our prophets. We're going to believe that 
this isn't that God, the Babylonian gods didn't conquer our God. Our God is sending us into exile because we haven't been faithful, which means we need to learn to be faithful. We need to learn to be God's people even in a pagan land. We need to learn how to do that. It was essential because the Jews recognized the power of culture. In a world that's pointing upside down, it's hard to live right side up. It's so tempting to just live the way the culture is pointing. A lot of people say, well, so what if our culture changes? I can just be Christian on my own. Well, good luck with that. Culture has power. You know, I recently saw something on the power of culture. I watched a PBS special about Jonestown in Guyana. Remember this in the 1970s? Before my time, but some of us may remember that. Uh, in the 1970s, there was... A, that was not an intentional dig. <laughs> but it kind of works that way, doesn't it? Uh, no, but seriously, you know, Jim Jones, right? He was, a, uh, he was a, a cult leader, right? Had a whole bunch of people who got them to move to Guyana, of all places, in South America, and built a town called Jonestown, named for himself. And then eventually, he... Um, convinced all of his followers that the American government was evil and that people were going to come take them and convinced his followers to kill themselves. He, they, they, they mixed uh, poisoned Kool-Aid and passed out the poisoned Kool-Aid with anybody, to, to everybody. And they didn't force anyone to drink the Kool-Aid, but almost everyone did drink the Kool-Aid. Over 900 people drank the Kool-Aid. Whole families drank the Kool-Aid and lay down together. Um, of the over 900 people there, only 14 people there chose not to drink the Kool-Aid. And a part of me is watching the show and thinking, why do they drink the Kool-Aid? You know, why don't you just stop? Well, the thing was, they lived in a world that was upside down. That's the power of culture. Everyone else was doing it. They lived in a culture that said that this, drinking the Kool-Aid is good and to resist is bad. It was a world turned upside down and it's so hard to live. Only 14 people stood against that. That's less than 2%. How do we become the sort of people who have the strength of character to recognize it's not healthy to drink that Kool-Aid? How do we become the sort of people to stand against what our culture is doing for what, is, what God is doing? Well, we're going to learn that from Daniel. That's what this series is about, because that's what Daniel is about. Many of us know the, the stories of Daniel, the great kids' stories. We did Vacation Bible School about Daniel. Those kids' stories are great, but let's never forget what Daniel is about. The book is about how to stand for God in a pagan world. And the great good news that God looks after his people even in exile. So we're going to learn how to do that. First step, Daniel chapter 1, exiles don't drink the Kool-Aid. So you see what Daniel does. First thing happens, you know, this is the, sort of the first conquering uh, of Jehoiakim is taken captive. The people are taken away. And they just, the Babylonians say, okay, now let's take all the best young men of this generation and let's take them aside and train them to be good Babylonian officials. Think about this offer. We're going to give you the best education you can get. And then you're going to get a great job at the end of it. And on top of that, it's going to have some terrific food along the way. Now, that sounds like a pretty good offer, since you don't have any choice at all, right? But think what the Babylonians were doing. This is brainwashing, pure and simple, okay? The Babylonians knew these Jewish people are going to resist being taken captive. But if we can take the next generation, if we can get this next generation to be good Babylonians, there won't be any more Jews. They'll all just be Babylonians from here on out. Daniel realized this. And so the first thing he does is he resolves, I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid. Quite literally, it was at dinner. And here they, at dinner, they have this royal food and royal wine. And there's meat at the table. Now, for most of us, we eat meat a lot of the time. You have to realize, in their culture, meat was a luxury. Right? They would eat meat on special occasions. Because right? they were an agricultural society. You had to kill them, the slaughter the animal to get the meat. But here... They had meat every day. Foods they'd probably never seen before, never tasted before, every day. This royal food and royal wine. 
Now, a lot of commentators will say this, well, okay, it probably wasn't kosher, right? This is why Daniel didn't eat it. It probably just wasn't kosher. Well, it, it doesn't say that, and that wouldn't have applied to all the food, and it certainly wouldn't have applied to the wine. Um, others say, well, you know, maybe it was meat sacrificed to idols. Well, that, that's a New Testament problem. That's not mentioned in, in this text. No, I think the real issue here is that Daniel decided, I'm not going to eat the food because it comes from the king's table. The problem is, if I eat this luxury and get used to this luxury, I'm going to be beholden to this king. I'm going to be enmeshed in this culture instead of remembering I'm one of God's people. So instead, even though I live in the palace, I'm going to remember that I'm one of those exiles, and I'm going to eat just like those exiles eat. I'm just going to eat vegetables and drink water. And vegetables included uh, grains and breads, anything plant-based. Um... And he asked permission to do this. Now, what's the meat and the wine of our culture? I want you to think about that. What is it that our culture says, here's a luxury and you really can't live without it. This is great stuff. This is what brings to an abundant, happy, full, fulfilling life. I look at how our culture celebrates Christmas with a whole lot of Santa and just a little bit of Jesus. The consumerism of our culture is the greed of our culture, the wealth. I look at entertainment, especially sports. You know, I look at education that says you can't live without that. Look at the, the safety and security, comfort. Oh, how much we value comfort. These are, these are the meat and wine that our culture sells us, the Kool-Aid that our culture tells us to drink. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves. I don't think there's anything wrong with that particular meat and that particular wine in and of themselves. It was healthy stuff. The problem was it came from the king's table. It enmeshes us in the culture. Daniel said, I'm going to step back from that just to remember I belong to God's people, not to that people. When we do this, when we say, I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid, the culture is going to push back. Uh, Daniel asks the official in charge, hey, can I, just, um, can I just have vegetables and water? And the official says, no, it's illegal for you not to eat the meat. I just had to point out, this is the first time a teenage boy had ever asked, I just want veggies. <laughs> and the guy who's in charge says, no, that's illegal. You've got to eat your meat. But, um, but that's what he says. No, no, if, if, if you don't eat this stuff, you won't be healthy. And if you're not healthy, the king's going to have my head. And Daniel sneaks around. Did you catch this? The official had said no. So Daniel asks the guard, the, the waiter, really, who's in charge of him, asks the waiter, okay, just for 10 days, would you just serve me and my friends veggies and water and just check out how it works? He has to sneak around to eat his vegetables. Um, and so, and that's what happens. Friends, our culture is going to push back. Our culture is going to tell you, if you don't go after the Kool-Aid, it's going to be deeply unhealthy for you and deeply unhealthy for everybody else. That's the way culture works. I had a friend of mine, Monica. We went to graduate school together, Texas A&M. Um, and Monica dropped out of grad school to get um, special, sort of simple medical training so she could go on the mission field to become a missionary, a medical missionary. Um... That's not God's calling on everybody's life, but she perceived that was God's calling on her life. Our graduate director, her graduate advisor, was appalled. He called her into his office, Monica, what are you doing? You, you are giving up one of the best educations in the country. Okay, we Aggies, we do exaggerate a little bit. But he said, you know, you're giving up a fantastic education here, and that'll give you a status, finish your degree. And, and on top of that, it can lead you to, to a real career which you can be real wealthy, have a good income, and then you can do good with that money, right? And, and besides which, here in America, we have a great health care system. We have a great education system. You can get health insurance here. Uh, we have safety and security that you won't have in some third world country. You, you should really stay here. And Monica said, Dr. Conrad, uh, God, God will take care of me. Well, what about your kids? What about your kids? You're going to raise kids uh, in a third world country and they won't have the American economy and they won't have the American education system and they won't have the American health care system. Well, I believe God's going to take care of my kids too. God's calling me into this. He's going to take care of me. 
And as she was telling me the story afterwards, she said, I realized that was what he'd lived his whole life for. He'd lived his whole life for this American education system and his status that that gave him and for his, his you know, the money and health care and safety and security and all of these things and comfort that, that we get in this American system. And she was turning her back on all of it because she perceived that was God's calling on her life. He was appalled. But here's what's tragic. Monica has some deeply Christian parents and they were just as appalled as her advisor. And when they spoke to her, they tried to talk her out of it for exactly the same reasons. Where are the Christians who don't drink the Kool-Aid? Where are the Christians who say, what I want for myself and my children is something different from the wine and the meat of this culture? The good news is, God takes care of people who don't drink the Kool-Aid. God has a better life for us. Abundant life doesn't come from the wine and the meat of this culture. Abundant life comes from God. We, we see in verse 15 here that after 10 days, turns out Daniel and his friends were all, looked a whole lot healthier than all of the other uh, young men. Now, there's some commentary who will tell you this was a health thing. Right? Who would tell you that if you didn't grow up eating a whole lot of meat and suddenly you're eating all meat all the time for 10 days, you're going to look terrible. Now, I've I got to tell you, I don't, think this is, I don't think it was the meat. I know teenage boys. I've been a teenage boy. I suspect it was 10 days with a royal wine. All right? That, but even so, this was not Daniel's plan. All right? Daniel was not on a health kick. He was on a faith kick. Right? Daniel was not trusting that vegetables would keep him healthy. Daniel was trusting that God would keep him healthy, and God did. God blessed his education and his learning so that he and his three friends... And why is it that we call Daniel by his Hebrew name and Shadnach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names? I don't know. But Daniel and his three friends um, all uh, looked healthier. They're, they were blessed in their educational journey as well. God took care of them. Because the simple truth is, friends, abundant life doesn't come from the wine and the meat of our culture. Abundant life doesn't come from wealth. It doesn't come from education and security and safety and comfort and health care. All of those are good things and have their place. But their place is under God. An abundant life comes from a real, everyday living relationship with God. It comes from from growing more like him in our spiritual disciplines through the habits of our everyday living. It comes from aligning my life's purpose with God's purpose for my life so I'm living out God's mission. That is where an abundant life comes from. That's so different from what our culture will sell us. You know, instead of seeking the wine and the meat of our culture, we should seek the living water that comes from God. But here's the twist. The twist is, in times of exile, we realize we don't always know what that living water looks like. In times of exile, we realize that what we thought was right side up may have been upside down to start with. Those Jewish exiles in this time of exile had to realize the way we were living before we thought we were God's people because we had the promised land and the temple and the monarchy and we were wrong. And our prophets have been telling us that for some time. But we really thought we were living as God's people and we were wrong. And here we are in our exile and if we are in exile, that is our fault because we haven't been faithful. Do you realize the courage it took them to declare this is our fault? And so those Jewish people in exile turned back to God. It was in exile that they turned back to Scripture. Or maybe I shouldn't say back to Scripture. Previously, they'd had, you know, the Psalms, they'd had Proverbs, they'd had their histories and their prophecies, but they actually, in exile, collected them all together and edited them into one book of Scripture. This is our word. This is God's history with his people. This is who we are. It was in exile 
in this pagan Babylonian world that they discovered monotheism. Before exile, Jewish people had believed in more than one God. That wasn't the official teaching, but that's what the people believed. Archaeologists dig up their homes, and every house we dig up before exile has a whole bunch of little pagan gods, little pagan idols in it. That's what they believed, and at least they believed in a lot of gods. But after exile, we dig up the homes, and those idols are gone. It was in the exile that the Jewish people committed themselves to worship of one God alone and no idols beside him. That's what the prophets have been telling them to do for a very long time, but it was in exile that they actually committed to doing it. And you see in the archaeology that they really lived it after that. Exile was a crucible for them. Separated the wheat from the chaff. Separated the people who were just sort of culturally God followers from the people who really said, I'm going to give my life to follow God. Friends, I'm looking at our American culture. I believe we're at an inflection point in American culture. When my grandfather grew up, it was very easy to believe that I was a Christian and I was a citizen, and those are exactly the same thing. If, I, if I'm a Christian, then I'm a good citizen. Uh, the American dream and God's dream are just the same thing for my life. I think that's getting harder and harder, and in a couple generations, I don't think it's going to be possible anymore. Maybe just a couple decades. I think we're at a point in American Christianity where there won't be any more cultural Christians. People have to decide, am I going to follow the ways of the culture or am I going to follow the ways of God? And it may feel like a crucible time for some of us, but we need to realize those two things the Jewish people realize in exile. First, we need to realize if America is not following after God, that's our fault. God is just as loving as he always has been. God is just as faithful as he always has been. God is just as passionate to help people turn their lives right side up as he always has been. And if people aren't listening to the values of God, that's not God's fault. It's ours. And the other thing we need to realize is just like those Jews realized, maybe some of the ways we were living before was, weren't right side up either. You know, too often, we Christians have mixed communion wine with the culture's Kool-Aid. Too often, we churches have blessed racism or consumerism or militarism or the various isms of our culture. Too often, we Christians have failed to challenge the evils in our culture because we want people to show up. We have measured worship attendance and worship style instead of true worship which the Bible says is living our lives as a sacrifice to God. We have enforced moral rules and we have pushed Bible information instead of life transformation from the inside out. Too often, we Christians have traded our mission to make disciples into a mission just to make converts, to get people to say yes, or a mission to make people comfortable since one of the chief values of our culture is to be comfortable. Friends, the good news is still good news. God really wants a personal living relationship with every one of us. He really wants to transform us more into the image of Jesus Christ and he has a purpose for our lives. That's good news. And to claim that good news, the first step is we got to recognize what Kool-Aid We've been drinking. So this week, I have a challenge for you. This week, all I want you to do is keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. What is the meat and the wine of this culture? What's the meat and wine that other people are saying, you can't live without? It's illegal to live without it. You gotta have it. You'll be unhealthy without it. That might not point us toward God. There might be nothing wrong with that meat and the wine. But the question becomes, if I eat that meat and wine, how enmeshed am I going to be in this culture? Will I be able to remember that I'm not one of those people? I am one of God's people. That was the first step Daniel took in exile. Let's pray. God, show us your will. 
Show us your desire for us, your healthy and good and perfect will for our lives. Lord, help us to feel the pressures that we just take for granted. Help us this week to see them, to notice them, to become aware of the ways we are pushed away from right side up. Lord, help us to seek your living water, to seek to live right side up, because we truly believe that's the path to abundant life. That's our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray it.